Retro game players, thank you for tuning in. I'm Marcus, and welcome to episode 7 of Retro Gaming Sunset. Welcome, Retro Game Players. I must bid the new subscribers hello as well. This is Retro Gaming Sunset. The show where we smash together multiple reviews from different channels into one show, which you are now watching. So, first off, we've got a very awesome entry from Dan over at Retro Zone, bringing us the movie machine. Let's check it out. Welcome to this edition of The Movie Machine. My name's Dan and I'm from the YouTube channel Retro Zone. Now, I love So Bad It's Good movies. There's something magical about watching films where everyone involved thinks they're making high-class cinema. And today's film is no exception. And it involves ninjas. So we're on to a definite winner there. So today, I'm going to be taking you through the wonder and the magic of Ninja... The Protector. Ninja the Protector was released in 1986 and directed by Godfrey Ho, but let's have a quick rundown of the plot before anything else. Forged US banknotes are making their way into huge quantities into society. The source of this is traced back to Hong Kong and an international special unit of the police is put together to find and stop those involved. Jason, played by Richard Harrison, heads the special unit. However, what Jason's teammates don't know is that he's also a ninja. An undercover police agent named Warren Lee infiltrates the forgery gang and relays information back to the special unit. During his investigations, Warren gets caught up in a love triangle, which leads to greed and stupidity. This all leads to the special unit closing in on the criminals with a final showdown with the leader of the forgery gang, who of course is also a ninja. The legend prevails strongly. Born a ninja, live a ninja, die a ninja. Whew, that was a lot to get through, I can tell you now. But if you're sitting watching this video thinking, hang on, that sounds like two different plots going on at once, then give yourself 10 points as you are right. Godfrey Ho was very well known for his cut and paste style of filmmaking. If you're not too sure what I mean by that, let me give you a rundown of what it is. In the 80s and 90s, Godfrey Ho created a series of martial arts films using this cut and paste technique. He would film footage for one micro budget film and then he would edit the film in a different order and add in shots from various obscure or unreleased Asian films to fill the gaps. The films would always lead to ninjas in some way of course and then finally he would dub the Frankenstein's monster of a film to make it seem coherent. With this technique, Ho was able to release several films with the budget of one. So all this leads on beautifully to talking about Richard Harrison, the star of the movie. In the early 80s, Harrison had an agreement with Godfrey Ho to star in a couple of his movies. However, without prior agreement, Harrison's footage was used in Godfrey Ho's now famous cut and paste film technique. So the couple of films that Harrison agreed with became nearly a dozen films. And because of this, Harrison actually retired from acting in 1990. So now that we've had a little bit of background about the director and the film, let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about Ninja the Protector in more detail. So where do you start with a film like this? As said, the plot is insane. And I love seeing how Godfrey Ho tries to put together a paper thin plot, which makes the film seem coherent. At times you feel like the film is going nowhere as you're getting little slices of two films. However, in a weird way, you kind of love it. 
As the film is made up with two separate plots, I think it's best to tackle these separately. So the love triangle is ridiculous with some really awkward love making scenes thrown in for good measure. Our leading man in this plot, Warren, must have been some kind of god as every woman in this film finds him attractive and just wants to be with him. At times I wondered if Tommy Wiseau or Neil Breen wrote the film. Well, at least Warren kind of knows how to have sex with women, although it looks more like he's doing press ups than actually doing the deed. At least he's not going for a belly button like Wiseau. There are some interesting fight scenes in this part of the plot which contains your typical 8-bit sound effects that you come to expect with a Godfrey Ho film. All in all, this was baffling, but had some genuine laugh-out moments. Now to the plot with Richard Harrison involving the Ninja Empire. You can't help but love the ninja action going on in these segments, especially where we see Harrison transform into a ninja in a Power Rangers style. The highlight of all this has to be the final confrontation at the end of the movie between Harrison's character and the leader of the forgery gang. They're ninjas on motorbikes. How does this fit into the ninja code as all ninjas are supposed to be quiet assassins? However, I did eat all this up as it was glorious. So if you like your Asian martial arts but don't mind not taking the film too seriously, then pick yourself up a copy of Ninja the Protector. These are really easy to get hold of, to be honest, as you can pick them up like this in a double DVD film pack or a six movie film pack. Like I said, they're really easy to get hold of. You could probably pick up the entire Godfrey Ho collection really easily. So like I said, if you like fun, great martial arts and some just laugh out loud moments, then pick up Ninja the Protector. I guarantee you'll enjoy it. So that's it for this edition of The Movie Machine, and I really want to thank Marcus for letting me on this edition of the show. I'm Dan from RetroZone, thank you very much for watching, and back to you, Marcus. You know, I love finding uh, DVDs like that, you know, with the double discs or multiple movies on one disc. Sometimes I just throw them away, like if I'm at Goodwill, but most of the time it's worth a second look because sometimes they're very interesting titles on those DVDs. So... I love finding those two packs like that. That's awesome. The Ninja Protector. What a crazy movie. I love how the director just splices in films, you know, from past works and calls them new. I mean, that's pretty interesting. But uh, there is something artistic going on there, and yeah, it's pretty awesome. Plus ninjas, you know. I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't love a good ninja, right? Okay, moving on, we've got Joe with Retro Cynical bringing us the toy trunk. Let's check out what he's got. Hey kids, it's Joe Grotesque from Retro Cynical and Generation Rad, here to bring you another edition of The Toy Trunk. On today's Toy Trunk, I want to talk about something that I absolutely love, and that's Ultraman. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Kaiju and Tokusatsu in general, and Ultraman is definitely one of the best known. Now, there's been a ton of Ultraman toys made over the years, and this is but one of them. However, it's one that I've not been able to find again on the internet. This one I snagged up a few years ago on eBay, and I've yet to find another one like it. And he is a tall glass of water. Now, something interesting to note on his feet, he has a copyright that says Ban Presto, and below it, it says Not For Sale. Now that leads me to wonder, was he a limited edition or a, a mail away? Uh, store displays, something like that. I really don't know. Regardless, he's pretty friggin' awesome. So, I hope you guys enjoyed taking a look at this little Ultraman here. And we'll see you next time. Back to you, Marcus! Whoa, Joe! Nice 12-inch figure, if you know what I'm talking about, man. No, that's awesome. Ultraman, what a classic series, and uh, yeah, that thing's a pretty massive size figure. You know, another uh, kind of similar uh, man-robot thing, I must say, is uh, Inframan. If anybody out there has seen Inframan, let me know, but that's like one of my favorite movies. I believe it was by the Shaw Brothers, 
But anyway, Ultraman's right there too. I mean, he's way more popular than Inframan, but I just have always liked Inframan. Anyway, thanks a lot, Joe. Great job. Go check out Retro Cynical if you've not checked him out, which why haven't you? You should have. Anyway, let's check out the uh, music beat. There's uh, somebody who looks very familiar bringing you a record. Let's head over there now. this segment of Music Beat, we're going to be checking out the soundtrack from Echo the Dolphin. Now, Echo the Dolphin is a game from 1993 by Sega. I first played it on the Sega Genesis. Uh, personally, I think it's an awesome game. And then these are the Sega CD releases. Um, I will say, too, that uh, the Sega CD version has the music that is actually featured on the record that's uh, playing in the background. So this is really what the soundtrack's from. And I remember playing this. It was so awesome. I seriously still love it. And uh, the sequel, I think, is also good. They're both really fun in their own way. Um, but with that said, the record that I got is uh, pretty unusual. So let's check this out. And here it is, the vinyl record of Echo the Dolphin. This is the limited edition blue version. However, what's kind of unusual about this is that it's not an official release. It's a bootleg. Um, I had to look this up because I thought it was a bootleg from Japan, but apparently it's actually from Germany. And then this is like, I don't know, it's weird, but um, the barcode says made in Japan back here. You can also see there's the Model 2 Sega CD. Um, it says made in Japan and apparently that's a fake barcode, which is really unusual. I got a great deal on this, uh, they actually tend to go for quite a bit, so I was very excited to get it for a good deal. But I love this soundtrack, and I remember playing it on Sega CD a lot, and when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's awesome, um, I don't really care if it's bootleg. However, the original artist, the guy who, you know, the composer, that's kind of a bummer for him, in that sense, if somebody's out there pressing any sort of bootleg, that's not good for him. So I was um, seeing some comments online about people hoping that like data disks might release this. I don't know, but if that's the case, that would be great. Um, I also was seeing one comment saying that the quality of the record isn't very good, so I'm going to check that out, and we're listening to it now. So unless I edit this and say that it sounds like crap, um, I think it's going to sound whatever we're listening to it. So anyway let's go ahead and open this up it is sealed so let's open it up and see what the record itself looks like i've got my batman trusty knife so let's do this oh it's a tight seal real tight oh my god that is crazy okay all right, I got it open, and I'm able to keep the sticker up here, which is nice. So I've basically left the plastic on. So let's check this out. Wow, so it is a very blue record, I must say. And yeah, that's awesome. Another thing that's really interesting, too, is that the um, artwork is by Boris. Uh, and you can see that on the cover, it actually says that. Now, Boris is a pretty cool fantasy art guy. Um, he did a lot of like the old D&D &D monster, what are those called, the monster guides, monster manuals. Anyway, this is interesting. <laughs> the uh, center cutout is uh, still kind of waxy there. But yeah, I think it looks fine. I don't know, it actually looks fine. And it's got a good weight to it, so it's not super cheap. I'm uh, definitely excited about this. I think Echo the Dolphin is a great soundtrack. But yeah, there you go. That's the Echo the Dolphin on vinyl by Spencer Nielsen. Great soundtrack, and hopefully it gets an official release, but this is going to be just fine for me. If you want to check out the soundtrack, do check out Sega CD's games. That's where it's got the great soundtrack. The Genesis version um, is a good game, so I wouldn't say go you know, avoid that or anything. They're, they're really fun games, but I just think the Sega CD versions are the best ones. So there you go. That's going to do it for this segment of Music Beat. Whoa, awesome review there, me. I totally agree with you. 
Uh, anyway, awesome game soundtrack, Echo the Dolphin. That is an extremely um, ambient but well done soundtrack. So highly recommend it. Moving on, we have a new uh, submission to Retro Gaming Sunset from a channel that has not been on here before, which I'm so thankful for you, bro. Thank you. This is going to be Kevin with Happy Beard Games bringing us a Super Nintendo review. Let's head over to Game Slam. Hey everybody, it's Kevin here from Happy Beard Games, and this is Game Slam. Today we're going to talk about the game Rock and Roll Racing on the Super Nintendo. Yeah, this game is a great, great, great game. And it surprised me as I've been playing it recently. Rock and Roll Racing is in top-down perspective, science fiction styled, fast-paced racing game on the Super Nintendo. And let me tell you, it lives up to its name, Rock and Roll Racing. Not only does it have great racing, it has a rockin' soundtrack. Rock and Roll Racing features some great classic rock hits, ported down a bit to some chiptune sounding Super Nintendo appropriate music. So it's not the actual, actual song, it's a rendition of the song. And it features some great hits such as Black Sabbath's Paranoid, you've got Deep Purple's Highway Star, you've got George Thurgood and the Destroyer's Bad to the Bone, you've got Steppenwolf's Born to be Wild, and you've even got the Peter Gunn TV show theme, which is a TV show from the 50s. Rock and Roll Racing came out in 1993 and was published by Interplay and developed by Silicon and Synapse, which later became Blizzard. Rock and Roll Racing features multiple gameplay modes, including one and two player. It's a fast, fun, rock and racing experience with over the head and over the top action. So let's check out some of the gameplay of Rock and Roll Racing on the Super Nintendo. Alright, so the first thing you see is the title screen, you've got your different modes, so we're going to go to single player. Now you have a variety of different characters to choose from. My favorite driver is the guy named Ivan, and he looks like Chewbacca, like literally, he's basically just Chewbacca. And then you've got other characters that have sort of similar archetypes or based on sci-fi style heroes. you got one guy that looks like an elf or a Vulcan, <laughs> and you've got like a cat girl, you've got different types of heroes that you can choose for for you to drive as. The next thing that you do is you choose a vehicle. Now there's basically two you can choose from from the start and then there's one you can save up for later on which I'll probably never be able to get. Before you buy your car you can also change the color of the vehicle so I chose green just to let you know. There's a couple things you can do before you start the race. You can look at the upgrades that you'll be able to buy with your money that you earn from the races. Some of those upgrades include better tires, a faster engine, different upgrades to weapons. Yes, you have weapons in this. You have multiple weapon types, actually. You've got a laser that you shoot in front of you. You've got, like, tacks that you can throw behind you that will slow down the opponent and actually stay on the track for the entire race. And then you've also got a jump, which I rarely use because it just seems to cause problems for me. So those all pertain to different buttons on the controller. Now the gameplay is pretty simple to start out with. You've got a pseudo 3D isometric viewpoint, which is over the top of the car, so you can see the track. It's not like Mario Kart or some other arcade racers like Rad Racer, it's different. And you've got this track going, and you're gonna basically drive along it. And it's pretty cool because you can steer using the L and R buttons as well, or you can use the D-pad. I usually prefer the D-pad, but if you're used to more precise controls, you may be better off using the L and R buttons to steer. My favorite part of this game, and when I think it gets the most fun, is when it's the most chaotic. Now, you've got other drivers on the track, you've got three other drivers at all times, so you've got competition, and it's a free-for-all, pretty much. And they'll be shooting at each other as much as they'll be shooting at you. And in the harder levels, when the difficulty starts to increase, such as on the next world, you will have them shooting at you even more, and more abilities, and their cars will get upgraded as well. So you gotta watch out for them, but for me, it's the most fun when things are getting a little crazy in the gameplay. And there's actually a really cool animation that it plays, a little cutscene that plays when you transition from planet to planet. It'll show you go in a spaceship, and the stars have a really nice graphical effect. It looks really 3D, but at the same time very Super Nintendo-y. It looks good while you're watching it, so it keeps you entertained as you travel and transition to the next planet, which will have a different environment for the racetracks and different racetracks set up. 
The game continues on in a pretty similar fashion. You know, you do races, you get money, you get points. You use that money to get upgrades for your vehicle from the various different upgrade selections, or you can buy a new vehicle. And that's about it for rock and roll racing. It's a fun, fast experience with a rockin' soundtrack, nice sci-fi features. It has a good sense of style and appeal to it, and it makes it a really fun game to have in your Super Nintendo collection. All right, guys, that's it for today's Game Slam. This is Kevin from Happy Beard Games. We checked out Rock and Roll Racing on the Super Nintendo in a little brief review, and it was pretty cool. I really, really do like this game a lot. If you have a Super Nintendo, I'd recommend checking it out. All right, guys. Bye. That is an awesome game. Rock and Roll Racing. Wow. Got some memories with that one. Great choice, Kevin. If you haven't checked out Happy Beard Games, go check him out. Uh, thank you very much, man. Okay, moving on, we've got one more review for you guys. Um, and this is going to be Dan with Odd Pod bringing us Reading Retro. But first, a word from our sponsors. Science creates a man beyond bionics, powers him with nuclear energy, equips him with thunderbolt fists. <laughs> and sends him on a mind-bending adventure in a motion picture that will stagger your imagination. Inframan, the ultimate in science fiction. Rated PG. Everybody. Welcome to Reading Retro, I'm Dan from Oddpod, and this is Garfield, His Nine Lives from 1984, a book I love very, very much. So, yes, I'm a big fan of Garfield, Garfield comics, Garfield cartoon, Garfield teddies, anything Garfield I absolutely loved as a kid, and this was one of my favourites. Basically, we all know the whole thing about cats having nine lives, well, this is Garfield's nine lives. It's, I'll show you, I won't obviously go through everything, but... It's basically just, you know, his nine lives throughout history. So we've got, like, in the beginning, cave cat, viking, all different things like that. And we'll just show you a little bit. Um, so the thing I saw the most as a kid, like, in the beginning, um, is when, basically, God created cat, basically. And it's got people saying what it should look like and things like that. Uh, the thing I saw with um, Garfield Nine Lives First was the animation, because after the book, there was a, um, like, a movie. Um, based on all the different parts of his life and it had this bit at the beginning um, with the whole creation and then we start off with cave cat and some of these animations were taken out um because like you've got all the different aspects like some weren't in the animation and some were added so um i'll go through so cave cat was in the animation and it was really good i liked it it's just got him like um coming out of the water and learning to breathe and all the different things that came out of the water too um, absolutely brilliant and the thing I love about it the most is um, each one like again I can show you at the front different animation styles for each of his lives and oh, it's so good so this is a very simplistic very cartoonish uh, animation style um, very more more visual this one because it's obviously cavemen so it's just you know, them saying saying certain words and stuff not actual proper English really uh, next thing we have Vikings Vikings was not in the animation um, but again, a different kind of style of animation there. More detailed, I guess you can say. Very, very cool. And yeah, I absolutely love this. I love the animation more, and I probably will review it on my OddPod channel sometime. But the book, so good. And like I said, I love Garfield so much. Uh, let's go to a different one. Skipping through, trying to show you another bit. Babes and Bullets. Now, Babes and Bullets actually got its own animation. Um... And it wasn't like that. Um, that's a really nice... Um, like it looks more like just an actual cat. It's the old detective, like the old 1930s, 40s detective um, thing. But this is like proper story. It's got like real cat pictures. But in the animation, it was just Garfield. But it, I'm pretty sure it was black and white though. But um, yeah, like I said, that had its own spin-off and I had that on VHS as a kid. Uh, didn't like Babes and Bullets as much though, but it was good. Uh, so let's skip to the next one. So the, the drawings, like I said, 
each of his lives has a different animation style. And it's the same with the um, the actual VHS tape, the cartoon as well, the movie. Uh, each of the animations had a different animation style. It was like different directors were taking it on. It was really cool. And the same thing with the book. So let's go to a different part of it. We have the Exterminators, another one that was not in the animation. But again, it's more, I guess this is kind of more Garfield looking now. Like the traditional Garfield that we know. And he's got a different, um, I think he's Chinese in this one maybe. I don't know, he looks, kind of, I don't know. He's got a weird hairstyle. And Lab Animal, here's one that was in the animation. Very, very cool. And again, completely different animation style. That's why I absolutely love about this. It was just, it wasn't just one whole thing, the exact same look. It just, it was so different. You can pick your favourite. Like I did with the animation on this, I've got a favourite that I love a lot. And this is one of them. Um, the lab experiment one is one of my favourite ones. And uh, here's another one. And uh, the garden, a very, very colourful uh, one. Very crazy, very colourful. Uh, is is a very memorable one from the animation as well. So yeah, just um, lots about it. Like I said, this isn't a full-on review. It's just I just really wanted to show this book because, it, and if you're a Garfield fan, it's a must-buy. You have to own this book. It's so beautiful and like I said, different art styles and how colourful it is and yeah, it's just amazing. And I forgot, yeah, like just looking at some of these pictures just reminds me of uh, looking at this as a kid, looking through it and everything. So cool. Um, Primal Self, I think this one's called. It's kind of like the lab experiment one. This one, you know, the animation style, I don't think this one was in, no, this one was not in the animation, but the lab experiment was. But it's kind of similar looking, I guess. But it's a bit more, um, as you can see, it's a darker. Uh, it's not just your colourful Garfield having fun eating lasagna and stuff. There's, there's a lot of um, different things in this. It's very dark. Look, look at that. That's terrifying. <laughs> and then, obviously, we have Garfield as we know him. And this is basically, um, again, in the animation, this is the birth of the Garfield we know and love. So, yeah. And he was born in an Italian restaurant, hence the whole love for lasagna. So, ah, oh, just so good. And that's when John buys him. So it's just, it literally is the history of Garfield from caveman, or from the creation of God, all the way to caveman, Vikings, all like when he was alive in the 1930s and 40s as a detective, and then all the way to being born in a restaurant, then being picked up at a, a pet shop by John, and being the Garfield we all know and love. But then after that, we have Space Cat, and this is the future. So this is his, basically his ninth life. So the Garfield we know love is the eighth, I guess that would mean. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So um, yeah, so Garfield looks, he looks a little bit different. Like he's a bit brighter, a bit rounder, I guess, in the head. He looks a little bit different than he did. But yeah, and then we've got a whole space adventure of Garfield here in the future. So bright, so colorful, Ugh, just so good. And that is Garfield, Nine Lives, Cave Cat, The Vikings, Babes and Bullets, The Exterminators, Lab Animal, The Garden, Primal Self, Garfield, Space Cat. And there were ones that aren't in this, that are in the animation. Um, there was another, they, oh, some of them are just so beautiful. Like I said, just different art styles for each one, same as the book, and just absolutely gorgeous. So... Yeah, not much of a review, I know, <laughs> but I needed to show this. Um, so if you are a Garfield fan, and if you're not, I don't know why you're not, because Garfield, he's amazing. So if you are, you have to get Garfield, His Nine Lives. It's such a beautiful book, gorgeous gorgeous artwork, and like I said, you may not like the modern Garfield, but you may like this one. You may not like this one, but you may like this one. It's just you know, something for everybody. So that is Garfield, His Nine Lives. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Okay, seriously, that book is awesome. What was that? That was, that, that was so weird. I have never seen Garfield drawn differently. I'm a huge fan of Garfield. I've never seen Garfield drawn differently, except for maybe Heathcliff. But, you know, I don't know. I think that Heathcliff would lose in a fight, miserably. But, you know, I don't know. He was kind of more of an alley cat, a little tougher. Beside the point there, I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. Who would win? Heathcliff or our guy, Garfield? Come on, you know? Garfield also has Odie backing him up with any kind of issues. Anyway, off the subject, Dan, thanks. That's a great book. What a cool book. I love that. I mean, I could just imagine like Frank Miller coming up with something 
Rupert Garfield. And then it's uh, Ink by his wife. I can't remember her name. Anyway, thanks so much, you guys, for watching. This is episode seven of Retro Gaming Sunset. And uh, if you'd like to contribute uh, a review, please contact me. Let me know. I'd love to do that. And until next time, you guys know what to do. You're going to keep that shit retro later on.